Welcome back to the Remedial Film Class Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. And I'm Travis. And I'm George. Hey, George, could you just hold on? I got to reach. Hold on. I've almost got. Uh, you know what? I'll get it later. Never mind. How's Word everybody up. doing tonight? Very good. Very good. Very, very good. Dan, your side boob is hot. By hey, the way. thank you. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. It's nice when men can so compliment each other. <laughs> hey, now. Hey, so we made George watch Basic Instinct tonight, and he didn't know what he was getting into. How are you holding up, George? Fine. Is that a poor choice of words? Holding up? <laughs> I don't even have to be held up at this point. <laughs> <laughs> He's rock solid. Ugh, yes. geez, at least. That's a good way to put it. Rock solid. I'm doing rock solid. He's a stand-up guy. Now, at huh. the conclusion <laughs> of our last episode, we mentioned that this was a Paul Verhoeven movie, and you were like, I don't know who that is. Do you know who that is now? Can you tell no. from this movie who this guy was? No. Travis, do you want to enlighten George as to who Paul Verhoeven is? Oh, Paul Verhoeven is someone you should be pretty familiar with. He made a small little art house film called uh, Robocop. Oh, and, okay. Uh, I believe, didn't he have something to do with Total Recall? I, I don't recall, uh, but I do believe he directed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he's a director. Yes. Who you've seen? How did I for, how did I forget that? A visionary, I don't know. if you will. the The name was really like super familiar, hmm. but it's been a while since we watched Robocop. I mean, easily confused with you know Steve Verhoeven and uh, Jeff Verhoeven. So I get it. Right. Right. It's a <laughs> very popular name in Hollywood, but and, right. And Herbert Hoover. Remember, guys, we're big in Amsterdam, so let's embrace <laughs> what's yeah, going so got on. Three listeners in Amsterdam. We have Marcel and his friends, and it's mostly <laughs> Marcel just making his friends listen to our show so we get downloads. Thank you, Marcel. Nice. Good dude. Nice. We should send him like some chocolate or something. Oh, wait. They got better chocolate there, don't they? Oh, they do. Yeah. It we would can be... send them firearms. <laughs> well, yeah, uh... they don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know what nice you're good pick. at, I guess. Mm. Sweet guitars. We got sweet guitars. Marcel's got sweet guitars. What the heck? He doesn't need our guitars. Damn it. All right. Your blinds are open and people are parking. So they're like, what are they doing in there? <laughs> That's cool. Is it's this like... one of them OnlyFans kind of places? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I feel like I'm in Friday 13th and there's like a POV going on over there. There's a camera Maybe they'll... in the parking <laughs> lot. Maybe they'll look us up. I don't know. Hmm. So, George, initial reaction, uh, was this a positive film viewing experience for you? Yeah. You can see why it's a classic. Yeah, it was good. Do you see why we made you watch it? Yeah, I mean, it would have been better as a Jallo, but... Yeah, I mean... <laughs> it is an American Jallo. It, it had a lot of twisty twisties, so, it, you yeah. know, you could, you could put it adjacent to the Jallo. I don't know that it really checks all the boxes, but it definitely has... What's funny is it does the red herring... Mm-hmm. mentality but it shows you all its cards in the beginning if you're paying attention like it, it, there's no mystery who the killer is but they try to like pretend that you're you don't know like it, she kind of hides her face but you know it's her well yeah and let's get into that i mean we <laughs> might as well jump right in because hopefully everybody's seen this movie uh a couple of times because it's a it's well, a heck of a flick yeah but you know you open up with this scene that is very clearly you think sharon stone very, I mean, just RoboCop levels of blood killing this dude. But yep. then the movie, it starts off as a cat and mouse where you're like, ooh, she's dangerous. She's mm. going to kill Michael Douglas. Ooh, Michael Douglas needs to be careful because she's going to kill him, like, for the whole first half of the movie. But then it takes the effort to, like, build in this feeling of, like, oh, my gosh, it wasn't her the whole time. I mm -hmm. was fooled by the movie. Yeah. And... They even go as far as to make the best friend or the... the uh the sex buddy kind of look like her. Roxy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of look like Sharon Oh, Stone. yeah. And yeah. then they do the whole jealousy thing. So then you're like, oh, well, maybe she's the killer and she just doesn't like any men being with her, with him. Like they, they, they almost show you everything in the beginning and then they try to make you doubt that. It's like Clue with boobs. Yeah. It, it does need a little bit of Tim Curry in there, I think. Oh, knows. Tim Curry would have set this movie off. <laughs> Put him as like the police captain guy that gets yes. killed. He yes. would have been great. But yes. him right next to the Newman would have been awesome. Good old Newman. Newman. But yeah, they do the work. And I think for a lot of these movies that would cop out and just kind of laze their way through the second half of the movie, this one, I mean, really up until the very end, uh, I would say successfully leaves you guessing the first time. 
Mm-hmm. Would you agree, George? Um, yeah. Obviously, I'm really leaning towards Catherine, right? Being like mm-hmm. the mastermind here. What I was trying to figure out was exactly how far Catherine's tentacles go, right? Like, um, like, who's like Doctor Garner, her thing, yeah. right? I like. I don't know. I guess about halfway through the movie, I was like, "Oh, okay." So, like, what side is Garner on? Mm. Like, does you know is Catherine influencing her? Does she know Catherine like that? Is she like? you know, nefarious, or is she really just like, you know? Plus they give her the job of being part of the internal affairs type situation, so it's like, it makes her even a little bit more mysterious as a character, because you're not really sure what her angle is, because yeah. she's connected to him. Uh, were, were they married? No, they weren't married. What, what were they? They were just hooking up, right? Who? At some point? Did, Did you watch the movie? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> No, I know. I know. Catherine and her had a relationship in college. One time, yes. Right. Yeah. But I might have missed her her total connection to, to Michael Nick? Douglas. I know they had yeah to Nick. I know they had a relationship, but they weren't anything more than just hookups. Nick's right? wife killed herself. Right. And yeah, I knew that. Nick and Beth. 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 Garner. I was trying to think of her first name. Yeah, Nick and Beth got it on. Right, and then they just kept it quiet. For a period of time. Right. Yada, yada, yada. Even though all the cops knew about it, they just kind of... Apparently. Yeah, word. See, I'm watching this movie from a different angle than you guys are. What's your angle? Like, this movie, came, was it 91, 92? Yeah, 92. Okay, so that's pre-internet. Like, worldwide web. Like, everybody accessing... Right. Stuff on the, on the web. Yeah, Al Gore and, hadn't invented it until 1995. Right. right. So, you know, you think about the only way you were seeing movies like this was if you had, like, Prism or Cinemax. Mm. Or going to the video store and renting from behind the curtain. Mm-hmm. You weren't going online. So, a lot of the people, I was, what, 17, 16 when this came out? It, you didn't see movies like this in the movie theater. Like, this was the kind of shit that you, w- you <laughs> waited till your parents went to bed and then you tried to get that channel in somehow and watch some of it. So, for a mainstream movie that had A-list actors in it, basically it was a Skinamax movie, but made a ton of money and had, I don't want to say full acclaim, but it had enough acclaim to be considered, you know, A-list. But you put any... You take the A-list actors out of here, and this thing is nothing but the crap you see on, yeah, on Showtime. It's a soap opera. Yeah, basically. so they 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 basically assembled the right group of people. Plus, it's kind of Hitchcockish. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> uh, okay, pun intended. Okay, <laughs> but it, it really uh, it feels like a Nico Mastrakis movie, just a little better. Like if you, you know, ever see that's in exactly the cold what of the I night. Was thinking. Well, yeah, I, I mean, was thinking a Zach Galifianakis movie, but yeah, okay. I mean, you know, it's six one half dozen the other. <laughs> Zach Galifianakis would have blown this up, <laughs> but you know, this comes in the wake of uh, movies like In the Cold of the Night, which is one of my all time favorites. And I'll bring it up anytime you want because it's like one part this, one part RoboCop, which mm. I mean, it's just mm. it's not good, but it's so much fun. Uh, but this comes a couple of years after that, and it's like. You know, you've got more explicit than Hollywood is used to sex, but also like explicit violence and just a little kind of loony edge to the storytelling. It, it's a lot of fun, guys. Hmm. So, question about the ending. Is she eventually going to kill him? Depends on what kind of book she writes. <laughs> and what right. ending she wants. I mean, if she's basically doing her... She's either writing books to cover up, like she says, cover up her actions or she's I doing she's, the actions to push the book she's just a psychopath that's yeah, like they all are <laughs> that gets off on putting everything mm-hmm. she does in a book yeah i mean he's no better <laughs> no so they're both kind of shitty people so they do deserve each other but is the ending supposed to be like she decided not to mm. or is he eventually going to get it i think it's supposed to be ambiguous so that we can have this conversation. 
So, right. listeners, go ahead and email us your uh, 10 minutes after the movie ends kind of epilogue for Basic Instinct. But, you know, they intentionally tease the whole time for the second half of the movie. Oh, it's not her after all. Oh, it's not her after all. But then, obviously, when they're banging at the end and she does the very showgirls inspiring uh, mm. <laughs> lean back move, which if you've seen showgirls, you know what I'm talking about. Actually, in out of context, the showgirls thing makes no sense. But once you've seen this, you're like, oh, she's right. just trying to do basic instinct and failing miserably. That's basically Paul Verhoeven's uh, dolly zoom, I guess. Oh, man. <laughs> the lean back. Anyway. I would so like she, to see Robocop do that lean She back. does the desperate <laughs> lean back. He couldn't do that in the suit. No, uh, not the suit. He'd need a different <laughs> suit. He'd need like the specific lean back suit. Anyway. He would need the Tony Stark suit. God, it would be CGI. stop motion is what it would yeah. be. You'd get stop Oof. motion lean back. Put that on a t-shirt. Stop motion, lean back. And reverse luge. Oh, jeez. Uh, so anyway, she does the lean back move. You think she's going to kill him. She snaps forward in ecstasy, I guess. And you're like, oh, God, did she stab him? I can't see him. I can't see him. And then she moves. You're like, oh, he's not dead. See, it was no. me the whole time. Me, the audience. I put it on her. She's not really dangerous. And then they get you with the stinger where she reaches. Or it shows under the bed that there was an ice pick that she was reaching for. So... I think it's intentionally ambiguous. You don't know what happens, man. But it clearly does put her back into the uh, we gotcha, she's the bad guy camp right at mm. the end. Okay, next question. Are the cops so dumb that they don't realize that everything is just so conveniently pinned on Beth who is dead? Here's the thing about this movie. The one thing that I will say for sure that this movie fails at for me and it, it's common in these movies. It's common in all movies nowadays. Everyone ends up too intricately linked for my taste. You know, mm. it would be a better story for me if there was no connection other than Michael Douglas between GN Triple Horn, uh, Beth Garner, and Catherine, right? Like, if they were literally only connected by the fact that they knew Nick, it's a stronger story and more realistic. And so for this, all of a sudden, like, oh, but they also did hook up once. And also, mm -hmm. she copied her. Like, it's just unnecessary. You know, at that now, point. Now, this came out before uh, Single White Female, right? Um, Single White Female was like 96, I think. Uh, I'll check. I think it's a little earlier than that. But 92 next year. Same year. Same year. Same year. Yeah. So it's all part of that same erotic Hollywood cycle. Hmm. So you think the characters are too conveniently intertwined with each other. Yeah, like it, they live in for your, San Francisco, for which is, has a population of how many million people? And these Lots. two banged in college and also happen to be involved with Nick and also they're not even at the same... You know, if they were co-workers, I see it. But it just didn't make any sense that they would have a past. It's just a little too coincidental. For me. For, mm. my, for Dan. Dan doesn't love that. But other than that, the movie's fine forgivable forgivable failure <laughs> well i mean they make up for it in the interrogation scene any it, any problem you have <laughs> it did um it you know having them intertwined like that beth and uh and catherine like it, it did have someone for catherine to blame and you know how this you know the story about who was copying who went back and forth yeah and it was it was like the same story but opposite hmm. like and you're like well you know who who do you believe it's Two, the exact same story three sides of every story right mm -hmm. well there is no middle of that story well it was the, her side one side the other side and then the truth like who who is well, you don't know yeah there Neither is, there is no middle to that someone was copying somebody maybe none of that was happening maybe they were both uh inspired by a similar shared source you know then they both blamed it on each other, like for what reason? Hey, listen. Here's chicks. the thing. No, you have to understand. It's definitely <laughs> one of those chicks had to have been copying the other chick. Right. George, you have to understand that Catherine hadn't even seen Beth until later, right? She'd already done the changes, and then she saw her later. Oh no, that's what the John, that's the John Carpenter version of this movie, not the Paul Verhoeven. <laughs> <laughs> and then their sisters. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Because well, you uh, he hadn't seen the Jollos till later. 
Uh, right. Okay. So so Sharon Stone's character hadn't actually ever seen <laughs> GM right. Triple yeah, until character. later. Right. She's walking around here like she's exactly. Sharon Stone. No. And let's face it, she's no Sharon Stone. <laughs> oh my gosh, so many things are coming into focus. <laughs> Do you see why we made me. you watch this? Because of the, the yes. Sharon Stone stuff from Not screen. to mention, when he wakes up in the middle of the night, what the fuck's on TV? Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's a <laughs> fucking Hellraiser. Like, oh wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was good on us that there's a Hellraiser reference in this movie. It's all coming. Together, and it was my guys. favorite scene too. And the scene where he's tailing her. Yeah, I'm like it's this my is my favorite scene. This is the opening scene of The Shining. Like it's it's that like airplane drone. Well, they didn't have drones then. Oh yeah, that's like shot. an airplane. I thought you were talking about the shot in Hellraiser. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was no. like no, but the, sh- the what was on the TV? The was shot? the creature. <laughs> it was the creature on the shopping cart. Yeah, but it was like the my VHS, favorite scene, like a TV version. So it wasn't Blu-ray, so you couldn't see you the couldn't cart see as well. It. Yeah, you could see it. Yes, <laughs> way scarier. In this, and in this case, it was it was it was VHS on a TV. A in the background TV, of, yes. a of a movie, so you yeah. definitely couldn't see the no, shopping cart, no, that but was as it was intended. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but no, the scene where he's like driving and they're they're weaving in between I know the exact, cars. I know exactly. I had a the shining scene. feel as soon as I saw it. I was like, oh I my know God. exactly the scene because I I because of what I think either you or Dan said it last time. Like, oh, that had to have been a helicopter, right? Like that took a lot of work. That took, a, and I and when I saw the scene, I thought that shot took a lot of work. Definitely, because it's the same kind of mountainside. You Nowadays, know. you just do that with a drone, right? Hmm. It really took me a little while to realize what city they were in, because they don't get too into detail about it until about I don't know half hour into the movie. So then that car chase happens, and I'm like, oh, it's San Francisco. Like, okay, cool. Well, and then they just over and over again, San Francisco, Frisco, County Police. You know, they did a good job after it got rolling to be more specific, but. Felt like it took him a long time to establish where the hell this movie was. When do they reveal it? When he visits her house and she's outside, and you can see the Golden Gate Bridge. Is that when they reveal that it's? I'm trying to remember. That might have been the earliest part. At some point, they talk yeah. about Frisco because it's like the county cop making fun of the local cop. Like, but right. I think that's a little farther on. But it just, I, I think until they got to the, the hills. Now maybe I just blanked out and ignored the background. Can't imagine that. It would was happen. it was the hills that got me too because. As you guys both know, I'm like really huge into skateboarding. Oh, right. And so you're those just hills, like, oh, I want to put those my board hills on that are, hill. <laughs> they are iconic in like skateboard videos yes. of dudes bombing these like ridiculous hills. So as soon as, you know, yeah, as soon as you see those hills, you're like, I know exactly where mm-hmm. that is. To that or it's Concha Hawken. <laughs> Could be Conchi. <laughs> Could be Conchi. No, not like that. No. That's like, Real hills. <laughs> Question about Michael Douglas, guys. Yeah. Has he ever been young? No. Because no, I feel like he's... he was old even in his 20s. Like an old, he's an old person. Genetics. I mean, his father looked old forever, and then he finally, when he got old, he looked even fucking older. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like Skeletor. But, I mean, it was like for 50 years... You couldn't tell what year it was when you saw Kirk Douglas because you didn't really know what year it was because he always looked the same. That's All right, really so funny, yeah. let's figure out how old Michael Douglas was in this when movie. they shot this movie. But don't tell me because I'm going to guess his age. Okay. Oh, he actually is kind of old. Okay. So we got to do we got to do some we got to do some math. I first. already know how old he was when he made this movie. So. Oh well, he was okay. All right. Okay. Go on. So, so what do you think he was? He looks. Like he's about 52. Really? How old is he? I believe he's in his early 40s. 48. Oh. Dude was born in 1944. So, okay, he actually- So he is old. He is old. Like, I just don't- I'm looking at his early career, and I'm not seeing a lot of like- What's funny is- Good for him. His dad is Hollywood royalty. Like, you think of Kurt Douglas, you think of Tony Curtis- uh, you know, I Alfred, don't. I don't think of any of these people. But I'm saying, like, they're icons, like Bob, right, I get Bob it, Hope, yeah. Jimmy Stewart. Like, that's the level that Kurt Kurt uh, Douglas is. Okay. And Michael Douglas didn't use that hardly at all. He he didn't really do anything worth anything until he was like 33 years old, 34. Yeah, that's the weird thing mm-hmm. is I'm not seeing movies that really stand out to me until '84 with *Romancing yeah, the Stone*. Did, *Romancing the Stone*. That was like his. That was like his coming out party was *Romancing the Stone*. It was it was a good movie. Sharon Stone. Well, he romanced the stone later. Yeah, definitely. 
But uh, this guy's really into romancing stones. <laughs> What's funny is that movie's with Kathleen Turner, who probably would have been a perfect pick for this movie as well. Mm. Maybe that's why he got into acting. Like what, maybe to romance stones. Yeah. No. Like yeah. Well, oh, maybe... and he was in an Oliver Stone movie too, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> You know, like maybe he wasn't doing so hot with the ladies, and he was like, "I'll tell you what, though. if I could just get into a movie, then the ladies would have to that's, that's, do me for the movie, and that's what he did." That's a great strategy from the guy who's now married to Catherine Zeta Jones. <sighs> Damn. Well, we need to know what happened before he became an actor. Uh, he had I'm probably a few money before. I'm telling you, he was he, he was, was in other stuff. He was, he in, was like, Steve was it Serpico. Was he in Serpico? He or? was Steve Carell from. Uh, 40 year old virgin he didn't know what boobs felt like <laughs> mm, I don't and know. so he had to get into acting huh. I'm just kidding I have no idea you I'm have just, no idea yeah just spitball but he's like the opposite of Kurt Russell who was acting since he was like six and <laughs> a and seasoned actor everything like from yeah, the time he was a veteran a before he was like 18 <laughs> Like he was ridiculous. Man, I think of like that career, and it's like I don't remember the world without Michael Douglas, but the fact that he only he he started so late. Who's the other one? Like Buscemi's another one who started really late, and Jeffrey Rush. I think he was like forty something when he did his first movie. I love so Buscemi. what you're saying is there's still time for us guys. There is still time, although I'm pushing fifty people. You know what's great about Buscemi? He's proof that you don't have to be good looking. No, you just got to be fucking talented. Yeah. I mean, not that I'm not good looking. Like, dude, I would be a great actor. Everyone would love me, but <laughs> like, if you had a toenail you haven't cut in 27 years <laughs> and you cleaned out people's a holes with it, it would still be nicer looking than Steve Buscemi. Dude. <laughs> he is a mess. There's something about Steve. Oh, he's such Buscemi a nice guy. Though. Anyway. <laughs> Such a nice guy. We're gonna have to cut this out because we might get Steve Buscemi on the show. <laughs> I mean, I think he would probably laugh at it if there was like, a chance. You guys are funny. Before if there's it anybody is over now, right? Yeah. It, it, uh-huh. If there's anybody who embraces what they look like, it's Steve it's Buscemi. Him, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, you want me to be uglier? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Put in the fake eye in. I'll look in both directions. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I love him. Why are we avoiding the scene? We have to talk about What's the interrogation the, scene? scene, but I don't think yeah, we're going we to talk about it for the same scene. reasons. I think you guys are going to talk about it for a more traditional reason, and I want to point out my favorite part of the interrogation I, uh, scene. So, I have a lot of reasons why I like that scene, and it really has nothing to do with her showing herself. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, because I'm a big fan of the scene prior to as well. You learn a lot about people. Because you know me, I'm an acting guy. I enjoy well, acting. She has mm-hmm. the moment Dialogue. where the guy, the cop says to her in the interrogation scene, did you kill him, right? He's been beating around the bush. She's been kind of mm-hmm. cagey with him and they're going back and forth and she's got a lot of you know, confidence and it's great. And then she's, he says flat out, did you kill the rock and roll guy? And she says no, but you, if you notice her jaw gets real tight. Like she does this real mm. like fight it kind of face. It's like the one time she slips. It's really good. Like it's mm. subtle. Uh, I'd never noticed it before in the newest 4K release. So maybe it's 4K. Yeah. 4K. Mm. This is what 4K brings you on the <laughs> interrogation scene. Jaws. Is her jaw, uh, jaw. just, jaw? she she clenches her jaw in such a way that she's fighting. You know, she's a pretty good liar. But, mm. and she just talked about, I'm a good liar, you know, and you learn to lie because of suspension of disbelief and the writing and all these things. So it's established that, like, she's got this mindset. And then, man, if she doesn't just about break and then controls it at the last second, it's real subtle. Mm. Oh, it's real good. There's a lot of that. Like, it, Douglas does a lot of reaction. I wonder if any of that's directed or if that's, like, character study. Because, like, he'll do, like, when they left their house for the first time and they're both driving back to the station. And Douglas is like, what the, what the fuck just happened? Like, he just kind of <laughs> didn't say a word, but just like his yes. demeanor is, you know, what what the hell was that? 
yeah. kind of, and it didn't have to say a word. And she's like talking to him at one point, and he just kind of, he just has like this kind of attitude with her, like I'm, I'm not playing your game, I'm not playing it. You can, yeah, I'm not playing it. I am enjoying it, but I'm not playing it. And then he winds up playing it. Yeah, to get his, you know, to get his uh, killer. Yeah, but uh, he's such a shitty person. I really honestly think he didn't care. I think he just saw an opportunity. He's an opportunist. He got involved in it. Like, I don't even think he cared if he figured out she was the killer at some point. I mean, that's one really cynical way to look at it. You could also say that he just fell into her temptation, right? She spends every moment of their interaction trying to manipulate and tempt him in, and eventually he just falls in. So if you want to take away his agency, you can. But I kind of look at, like, that scene in the dance club. I looked at it the other way. Like, he's playing the cat and mouse game with her, and she's playing hard to get. He's playing, you know, flip it kind of attitude towards it, and then they're both kind of obviously flirting with their eyes and stuff. But when he finally grabs her and pulls her in, does whatever, that face she's given, that's someone who's like, yeah, I'm not manipulating you. You're manipulating me kind of face. Now, she might be that damn good, but... She seemed to be as much into the get as he was, and not so much the uh, manipulation that you would think she was doing. I think she wanted him as much as he wanted her. I think you're wrong. Why? I think she was manipulating him the entire time. However, I do think that him getting involved, like the way he did, threw a wrench in it. Okay. Right? You don't think she fell in love with him at all? Mm, I don't know. I they think also point, leave that up to yeah. interpretation. I was just going by her behavior and, and like it, there's a switch that happens in her demeanor. Like she's it, she does it in the interrogation scene too. Like she's in yes, control yes. the whole fucking time. Yes, because she because that's like I said that's the that's the wrench. She doesn't expect him to be like that. Right. So then she kind of has a, uh, I don't want to say in love with, but she definitely has an emotional connection to him at some point. Definitely. That changes. She's like, she thinks he's the coolest motherfucker ever, and she did not, she did not think that right. when she was trying to manipulate him in the beginning. And she's like, oh, crap. Like, he's, he's badass. Right. Because, like, he's, like, crazier than me or as crazy as me. I'm curious to find out, like, people that were involved what they would say. Because there's a lot of movies like the Wild Things and other movies where there's that cat and mouse going on through the whole movie. You don't know what people are thinking until the reveal or the exposition happens. And then you're like, oh, okay, I get it. Now I I see who's been working together, and I get it. This movie, you don't get that because you never really see what her end result was, what her purpose to manipulate him was other than to take him off her trail I think it brought her, him more on her trail by the behavior she was doing. So I don't think that she was trying to throw him off, per se. I think she enjoyed the attention. She's kind of a narcissist. I think she enjoyed the attention of being a suspect. Yes. And she does a lot of in-your-face kind of, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write about the guy, and then I'm going to kill him exactly how I wrote it. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, that's what you did. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what you did. So, well, yeah. and I was kind of annoyed just because of how like on the nose they make it beforehand where they're like she's going to say that oh, how stupid am I to write the book and then do it that way and then she says right. how stupid am I? And I'm just like oh my god. Okay, yes. But again, you're it. dealing with Paul Verhoeven, so it's like But I like that they turn it around and then he at some point has to do the same oh how stupid would I be? And it's just like okay, yeah. fine, you paid it off like oh. I don't know. I think that I think that's done on purpose. Like uh, it's definitely on purpose. Again, I just don't know is, if I, I. Yeah, it might just be too on the nose. But at the yeah, same time, you. okay, you put the effort in. Participation award. In the end, he is doing a, a satirical version of these murder mystery detective type movies or books, Hitchcock type mystery things. So it's it's satirical, in a way. But then it's twisty too, so it kind of makes it not so tropey. 
but then there's a lot of tropes and like I think that's what makes it good is it's it's makes you think kind of like uh what's the uh sixth sense it takes a, st- a basic story but because of the twist it makes a genius you know it just takes a basic ghost story i have to tell you when i was watching this movie um michael douglas's character reminded me very much of my favorite character from my favorite movie of all time, which is American Beauty. N- thank oh. you. Thank you. Um, American <laughs> so, Beauty. Okay. Do you remember in American Beauty when um, Kevin Spacey's character decides to like frame his boss and mm-hmm. gets a, a year's salary and benefits and just decides I'm going to do what I want to do yeah. and fuck everybody F- else? F you money. Right? Okay. It's my favorite character of all time. When Detective Nick starts getting involved with her, when he makes the decision to get involved with Catherine, it's like he is living his life the way he wants to. Hmm. You know, he goes back to drinking Jack Daniels. He starts smoking again. And like every time someone mentions it, he's just like, Bug off. <laughs> you know, I'm fucking the murderer. Or, you know, he's like, I'm going to do what I want to do. You know, mm-hmm. read a different way. It's my way, favorite kind of character. Read a different way. He loses all agency, falls into her trap, and completely loses control of his life. But she's hot. Yes. Though, so, I mean. <laughs> but that's what he wants. Yeah, maybe he or wants Or that's what she all tricked about him into thinking he wants, man. Nope, mm. nope, 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 nope. No. He wants to drink alcohol. He wants to smoke. He, he wants, wants to, to he wants to have <laughs> really uh dangerous sex. Let's put it that way. So are That's you what he saying wants to do. She is He's the, living outside the box. She's like yes. the devil incarnate in this movie. Does that tie this in with our other movies? Like Yeah, she she's, is vice she's the full temptation. That. She is temptation. She's the personification. Of temptation. Is she I even a real person so, in yeah. this movie, or did he stab that guy? And also, he, <laughs> you know, <laughs> does she just exist in his head? Like, I don't know. Holy shit! Is is he on Mars? <laughs> See, you'll notice in this movie that in the way the furniture is arranged, and sometimes there's a light switch there, and sometimes there's not. Right. That's when you know. But the Kool Aid is in the pantry. Right, right. That's how and you know the walls if, are very thin. That, exactly, <laughs> and that's how you know if it's reality or not. Right, because when the walls are thin, it's not real. Right, those Pasadena thin walls. No, these are San Francisco Although regular walls. They, yeah, these would have thin walls would have been fine. Mm. That's how. That's how you know that's it's you know. not reality. Is when the walls get thicker because they're in San Diego. <laughs> and the camera shots from behind. Right, right. I got you. Yep. I'm glad you watched. <laughs> There's a scene, speaking of good mm. acting earlier. Our listeners are like, what, what the heck? F- just did <laughs> This is why they have to listen to every just... episode in order or else none of this makes sense. Yeah, we did We did major callbacks to something that <laughs> no one listened to. No, he, he, Aaron knows. Aaron listens in order, I'm sure. Yeah, Aaron. Hey, the so two guys in the back. There nice is guys. the. Uh, there's a scene in this movie that impressed me for the most subtle of... It's not even a, it wasn't even the subtlety of the acting. What impressed me was the consistency of tension between two obviously different scenes. And it's when Nick and Beth are tense outside and then they go to, I think it's his apartment, and they're mad mm. and kind of tense inside the apartment because these are clearly not shot back to back, you know. But the right. intensity was so consistent between two different complete scenes that it's believable that they actually just walked in the door and continued shooting. This Mm. is some high level acting for a movie that really doesn't deserve it. And I love that. Well, they're high level actors. I, I kind of agree, man. Like, yeah, I do. You agree that the movie doesn't deserve good acting? No. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like with all, with everything that is in this movie, that should be the focal point. And I guess for some people watching this, especially like when you're 16, that is the focal point. But oh, like for totally all was. of that sleazy yeah. stuff that's in this movie, 
it should not have the quality acting no. that it has. This was it's the reason kind of why we have that crap. Like this movie was so well received, like mainstream, that that's why we got the Skinamax like resurgence of the early '90s into like 2000. Like three days. Like Sh- what was it Shannon Tweed? What's his name? What's his name's wife? Oh, Shannon uh, Tweed. Jean, yeah, Jean, yeah, Jean, Jean, Jean Simmons', Simmons wife. wife. Yeah, she made a career out of making these kind of movies on Cinemax. Like it was like. Other than that, she's just Gene Simmons' wife. I mean, she was a model, but right. she became a household name because of movies like this made her career. They're like, we want to do Basic Instinct, but we only want to spend about ten grand, right? <laughs> so every movie always had the mysterious this and the you know seven or eight scenes where someone was getting railed and and then uh, and then there's a reveal at the end. So very much yeah, like how for, you know you get your Jalo. Run in Italy, you get your Dirty Harry inspired cop movies. This movie mm-hmm. created a whole genre that was already there. I mean, really, you could. It was there. You yeah. could probably trace the this movie directly back to stuff from Brian De Palma ten years earlier. Mm-hmm. I would love to do that if you guys want to do that next. I'm into De Palma, uh, and De Palma, yeah, of course, I mean, like comes like straight out of Argento. Like so that. I mean, really, this does yeah. this is down the you know down the family tree from my Argento Jallos. It's just this right. this one made money. Like money. Yeah. And it had the charm of a Hitchcock movie. Like it it, it took the time to do some style stylish things. Yeah. Like you have the good acting. That that changes. That's a game changer yep. in a movie like this. Because yep. then you're interested. And like I said, you get these the whole probably the whole script is throwaway. Uh, because they just want to show boobs. But Actors right, will... I've n- I've never seen anything like this. Right, and then the actors take the words on the page. They're like, listen, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna perform the shit out of this, and then we're gonna bang. But I'm gonna perform the shit out of this dialogue, and right. then that I've never can seen anything like yeah. this. I didn't know that. I didn't know that this existed. Hmm. There's not a this whole lot of it, of... man. This is a pretty yeah. rare one. No. Yeah. Right. And what's funny is it does touch on a lot of things that we've already watched. So if we watch this first, you'd probably be like, what the fuck? Eh. Yeah, it'd be a real, but like, oh, it's you, this kind of podcast. kind of Yeah. Thing. I think <laughs> the fact that you have background now helped a yeah, lot. Yeah, definitely. Well, in 50, what is this, 52 movies in, you can now see the value in a movie that you may not have seen in episode one or two. So I think it's a sign that right. we're doing our job. Definitely. Because you didn't just look at this like, what is this schlocky boob-filled thing? Hmm. And what's funny is I saw a, a discussion about this movie. <laughs> you mean like Torso? <laughs> torso rocks. You don't, get this yeah. mo- you don't get this movie without Torso, though, man. Torso's in the, geni- in the genetics. I'm just kidding. Mm. I don't, honestly, dude, I don't even remember Torso. Oh, you gotta watch Torso. Like, it's real good. Because, I mean, I, I watched it. I know. We all saw you watch it, was, it on pain meds yeah i watched <laughs> but you were it high on but Percocets. like i i don't remember that <laughs> you were chewing on squirrel nuts uh <laughs> the boobs are all all i remember right from that movie so, so i i saw a discussion on this dan and it kind of i thought it would be fun dan, i don't think uh george could participate because he's uh uh-huh. not well you might be able to but the discussion was because of the the uh character of catherine and the time period 1992, 91, 92. Not many people in Hollywood could play that part. And they, the discussion was go back then and try to think of an actress back then. That was, uh, you know, she, Sharon Stone really wasn't that big, that big of a name. Like she had just done uh, smaller parts. She was in like Action Jackson. I think she was in, I don't know if Total Recall was before or after this, but. I think it was before this because Total Recall was like her coming out. Um, but you think about who could like a uh, Julia Roberts couldn't play this part. Uh, no. I'm trying to think of that time period who the actresses were of the time. Kim Basinger maybe. But Kim Basinger, like just what Sharon Stone does in this movie. Kim Basinger played in a very similar movie that George hasn't seen. Uh, right. Nine and a half weeks. I can weeks. think of modern actresses that could. And I don't know that she like I like her a lot. She, 
I have a, an affinity for her because of Batman. So Batman, nine and a yeah. half weeks like kind of makes me uncomfortable because I don't ever see her mm. in that way. I see her as Vicky Vale, you know. Uh, that's right. just my own where I grew up with it. But I just don't know that she has the chops. Now, no, she could not do this part what Sharon Stone did. Do you know who could do this part and would be age appropriate for Michael Douglas and so it would never happen? I think uh yeah. I think Helen Mirren could have knocked this Bat. one out of the park. Really? I think she could. How man. Old? She's a year younger than Michael Douglas. So of course she's okay. too old to play this part cuz Hollywood is super ageist, but I mean, have you ever seen Caligula? Hmm. She did I mean, she was willing to, you know, uh push the envelope in terms of sexuality in Caligula, not as far as some of the people in the post-production added scenes, but she's definitely, you know, uh, you know, she's no prude. Uh, and right. she's got the acting chops. So I think she could have done it. Right. She's the first person that comes to mind that like would have had a good shot at it. But again, right. she's 45 years old. And so Hollywood would have been like, uh, women can't be over 30. Ooh, you know, I don't know if that was the case back then though. Like, I think it it was more fair back then for the, for the 40 somethings. How Especially old? for a position that like that, like that, that's a that's a position of a of someone that is established. So obviously they're going to be a little older than a twenty something. Well, I guess Glenn, I mean, Demi Moore was doing stuff like this back then. Glenn Close was in Glenn Close, uh, Fatal yeah. Attraction a couple yes. of years earlier, and she's about the same age as Michael Douglas. But so. she's not as attractive as Sharon Stone. She's hot, but she's wacko hot. <laughs> Like she's crazy. I like that the woman who just stabbed a man with an ice pick in the face is not <laughs> psycho hot. Is not wacko hot. Okay. Yeah, but uh, all right. What I'm saying is, like we've seen Glenn Clo- Close play that part, but she played it differently. She played more of like a, a psycho path. And not to me, more is like twelve years younger than Michael Douglas. So. Okay, she's like she's the yeah. more traditional choice, right? The Hollywood thing where you put the women in who are younger. But she played his boss. Was she his boss in Disclosure? And she tried. Yeah, like she was a position of power. Yeah, she was. And and damn. But uh, I I don't know. I'm just trying to think of. I would never even thought of Muren because she really didn't become mainstream until the 2000s. What well, about but today? She was doing who, cool who, stuff. Uh, you know, she did. Uh, well, she worked with what's his name uh, that directed Peeping Tom in Age mm. of Consent back in 1969, 70, somewhere in there. Uh, Michael what Powell. What about Michelle Pfeiffer? Does Michelle Pfeiffer have the acting chops in the 80s? I guess this is 92, so she's, uh, 92, she's coming so up on she's Dangerous like Minds. Dangerous Minds, yeah. She's got some chops in that movie. She's sexy as hell. But I don't think she has that... There's just something that Sharon Stone does in this movie that I don't see many people being able to do. She's dangerous, man. She comes across as threatening but while that's, also that's being seductive. like, it's cool. Like, I've, n- I've oh. never seen, because even when she's Catwoman, Michelle Pfeiffer doesn't have a certain, like, magnetism. Maybe she does, though. Maybe again, because I'm seeing that. She's sexy, but visually sexy. Like, her eyes, her lips, like, she's sexy. But she doesn't come off sexual. She doesn't come off like the way Sharon Stone does. Like she doesn't come off as that that seductive sexiness. Like she's just hot. Michelle Pfeiffer's hot. I could see her in a pair of jeans and a t shirt and she's hot. Like she doesn't but she doesn't really pull off that seductive even when she was playing like Catwoman and her thing was seduction, she wasn't really pulling it off the way Sharon Stone does. You didn't see Batman too, yet, so no. But there's just she's always been sex like in Wolf. I love her in in Wolf. She's the fucking hottest Michelle Pfeiffer in Wolf. That's like ninety six. So, but I just again, and she does really good acting in that movie. I just don't see her doing the seduction that's called for in this part. And I'd be curious to see what it's written, what the character's written like in the script. Or if that's all Sharon Stone, like putting that in there, because some scripts they completely tell you, you know, looks with a you know seductive blah blah blah. Right. 
so you can actually read it. I, I love those websites, uh, the YouTube YouTube videos where people are they're playing the movie and then they're showing the script. Someone's reading the script and oh, then yeah, showing I the love, movie. I love those. Yeah, yes. so you can see what the actor's doing, but what the script is saying. Yeah, those are always that's my shit. Yeah. That's my jam. <laughs> now, what about today, Dan? Who I know this movie wouldn't even be made today because the Me Too movement would would be all over it but i don't know no it's so quickly people are these days well oh they couldn't make blazing saddles today it's like well yeah they could and oh they couldn't make this movie they totally could they totally could you could totally make this movie today no, they could but it's a matter of if, yeah if if people are going to go see it though is what i'm saying like yeah they could make it you can make anything i mean you you can make uh, the human centipede you can make any movie but the public from 1992 is a lot different than the public today. Well, I mean, you can look at it. You can look at it two ways. I mean, you could view that you know Sharon Stone's part as like a uh, powerful woman, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm speaking more like the rape scene and a couple other things. Like, there's just you. You still have rape scenes. I know. You know, I just you still have. I don't rape have scenes. faith in the public like I used and that, to. And <laughs> that that scene, by the way, was like. It really told you a lot about Beth. You and know? him. Like, well, yeah, and him, too. Yeah. But, like, for me, it was Beth. It was, like, she just, like, that just happened to her, and she was, like, like just couldn't show any emotion because, like, at the end of the day, she's a cop. Mm. You know what I mean? And they don't really specifically... And they show a lot of like a close up. You don't know what she's thinking. You don't know what what the purpose of that was. Like what? Yeah, it's yeah. played well because it's such a horrible situation. But then you're looking at it. You're like, she said no, but she said yes. It's a like, complex. I don't know. It's a really Definitely. complex. Yes. It was very complex. <laughs> yeah, it was very <laughs> complex. Which is why it was. Such a great rape mm-hmm. scene. Well, and it was so much. I, it's, it feels weird saying that. <laughs> it was successful, <laughs> really and it weird. would still be successful in a movie today because it is so complex. You can't just write it off as yeah. victimizing, right? So many movies, right, right, especially right, right. from the seventies, would just be like, "Oh, hey, here's a rape scene, and it's really long and unnecessary." And now, but see, it justifies the rest of this movie, and it's like, or you could just not victimize people. Like that's the, from what I'm reading. Uh, of the I think public reaction these days, it's not that you can't have situations that are complex. They just, you know, the tired trope of using a rape scene to create sympathy for a character is unnecessary. Hmm. So then, if they made it today, who would you see? Who would be an A-lister? Scarlett Johansson. Ooh, that's who I'd cast. But I don't today. think she does nude scenes. She would if she was in this movie. You think she would have to? Can we do that? Can we get that done? <laughs> <laughs> I think you could still, you could probably make, you could probably perform the process of making this movie and get it inside. You you wouldn't need like nipples in bush, right? Like you could right. make this entire movie still explicit uh, without the specific elements that for whatever reason in American movies qualifies as contractual nudity. Have you ever seen a movie, Travis, no. called Disobedience, I think is the name of the movie. Yes. Have you guys is ever heard it? of a movie called Disobedience? No. It has an insane, like, explicit scene between Rachel McAdams and Raquel Weiss or Ra- Rachel Weiss. Rachel Weiss. However yeah, you Rachel say her Weiss. name. It's insanely really? explicit. Like, it is like, whoa, like, shocking. Uh, but contextual, like it, ha- you know, it, it's like this movie where it, it, yes, it is, it's explicit and shocking, but like, it is justified by the narrative of the movie. It's like Crash. But I don't think you see a nipple, right? So is it a nude scene? No. But is it like mm. basic instinct level sexual interaction between two developed characters? Yes. So I think you could okay. even in today's kind of more uptight about nudity, uh, a list Hollywood crowd, you could have this movie just as successfully in just a couple more shadows. Mm. I'd say a shadow of a nipple. <laughs> Great movie. We probably won't watch. It makes me think of, uh, there's a scene in, um, it was, uh, 
what is that? What is that Netflix series Snow, that Snow White? That no. sp- Kevin Spacey plays the president, and he's oh, screw- House of Cards. He's screwing this reporter. Yes. So there's a there's a scene where the reporter, this young chick reporter, is like on the phone with her dad, mm-hmm. and Spacey's like going down on her. Nice. That's disgusting. This is <laughs> like it's one of those scenes that's like so explicit. Yeah. You're like, holy, I can't believe they're doing this. I can't believe Kevin Spacey was doing that. <laughs> right? <laughs> and Ugh. There, I don't think there was any nudity. There, like, right. You didn't see anything, but it was just like, it was so explicit and so like, like, ugh, makes your skin crawl, but you don't see anything. What's funny is that we're discussing this because we're afraid of what people are going to, you know, today's people, oh, we can't see this, can't see that, yet- like Fifty Shades of Grey sold like thirty million copies. <laughs> yeah, like, and like on the Grammys last week, there was a couple chicks humping each other on yeah, stage. Yeah. So screw it. Singing wet, wet pee. Yeah. yeah, whatever. Yeah, so I think we just need to chill out and go back to the nineties. You may be right. I just, the music was better. It's an interesting world we live in, where HBO's most popular shows, like, front load their series with nudity and explicit sex. But our movies, our cinema experience, is so aimed at that like PG thirteen money demographic that like mm. slasher movies don't have gore as much anymore, and then the you know they don't even try to make Basic Instinct these days because who is going to go see this movie? It's an interesting. Yeah, time. everyone's going to be offended you by know this who movie. I think I mean Dan, you keep saying it, but you know what? Who I think ruined Basic Instinct type movies? Who? Well, who who made Basic Instinct? Paul per- Verhoeven, right? Oh no, are you gonna blame Showgirls? Yes, it did bomb pretty hard, and it does suck pretty. Oh my bad. god, that ruined it! Ruined it. Can we he watch that next? Movies. Can we watch that next? That movie is so <laughs> bonkers. The only, the, the honestly, the only thing that made that movie it made anybody go buy a ticket was my generation wanted to see Elizabeth Berkley naked. That's that basically what it was. The chick from Saved by the Bell, it wasn't the right one. I wish it was the other one. But the chick from Saved by, Saved by the Bell was doing nudity and people wanted to go see it. Same thing with, with Burlesque and, and all those other movies that were crap. The enticement of seeing somebody who's normally not naked, naked. I sat through that stupid Mirrors 2 movie that you told me about. <laughs> Worst movie ever. Worse you shouldn't than, have done that. That's not a good movie. I, I, I even watched it at like twenty five. Like I was like fast forwarding it, and then I got to the scene where that I wanted to see, and I was like, okay, it's a horrendous movie. But <laughs> I mean, horrendous <laughs> movie. Okay, we get it. <laughs> How'd you like the movie? Though? <sighs> was it pretty good? <laughs> horrendous. <laughs> But it was worth the price of admission. It was worth the money I spent on the desk because it had something that I thought I would never see. So. Well, and you bring up an interesting point, right? I mean, I don't know if you meant to, but you're bringing up an interesting point, which is when people looked at the success of movies like Basic Instinct, if they read it as it was successful because a famous lady got naked, then they would go and make showgirls. They would go and make burlesque or striptease or any of these that were only really sold and marketed and framed around the fact oh that a God. famous actress was going to take off her shirt. And it was like, but Basic Instinct also had excellent acting and a great plot. Yes. Like you forgot you the rest say, of the movie. You just said striptease. Uh, uh, Is that okay? Do you like I that movie? I thought Mirrors Two was bad. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I've striptease. never seen Striptease, but I understand oh, that it is a, horrible. a terrible movie. But the draw was Demi Moore was a stripper, and she was showing off our new body, and Burt Reynolds was in it. So you're like, okay, Burt Reynolds is coming off of uh, being out of basically in retirement, and he's in a movie. I'm going to go see it. But with Basic Instinct, I mean, you guys were probably still in diapers when that movie came out. Um, No. We were not. No, you were probably playing with Legos. Yeah, no, definitely in the Lego phase. Yes. All right, so I remember the hype of that movie, and the reason why that movie made so much money was everybody on Monday morning said, dude, you have to go see Basic Instinct. She shows her. She shows She opens her legs. She shows her beef. 
That's that's what it was. Everybody was talking about that scene. Hmm. And it was like, it was shocking because not only was it Sharon Stone, who everybody was like, that's the chick from Total Recall who's hot. Mm Mm-hmm. You hardly ever saw full frontal unless you're, you know, renting something. Unless you're paying for it. Yeah. And then you're definitely not seeing, you know, open sesame. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in, a, in a regular theater. I hope it says me. Maybe I need to watch this in 4K. Maybe. Because I didn't see what I think I was supposed to see. No, you don't. It's not as detailed as, there, as you think it would be when people no, say she yeah, did it. You no, don't. it's just a matter that she did it. Right. And that, it's it's funny because when we were talking about that scene earlier, like, I think I mean, Dan was alluding to that, the fact that that's, that's that part of the scene. Like, that's what we're going to remember. That is not even what I remember at all. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that happened, and I was like, okay, yeah, that's, that's because like... Because it's, it's an amazing movie. That, that, that crosses the line right there. What I was thinking of was how the two, in, the, the two um, interrogation scenes mirror each other so mm-hmm. closely, almost too closely, like Dan said. But yep. we don't see Michael Douglas's Bush. Which Not is a shame. Which is a shame. Fine. I Not will say shot. for a movie where, it, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's just because I was watching the 4K cut. There was one scene where I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure I just saw his, oh. like Yes, you do, apparently. That's some yeah. A-list, A-list privates. So that's, that's like kind of funny. Schwarzenegger did it in Terminator. It's kind of funny because this is a movie with two dicks and one bush. And we all yeah. talk about the bush as if it's like, but I mean, there's two. I mean. All right. Okay. Watch Wild Things. You get to see... Kevin Bacon's full schlong. There you go. Boom. Oh, Done. really? Huh. Or 28 <laughs> Days Later. 28 Days Later. Or what's the one with, a, is it Saving is Sarah Silverman? <sighs> Saving Silverman. Saving Silverman. Yeah, you see full S- full schwang in there. Saving Silverman. You have like yeah, a catalogic knowledge of dongs and yeah, movies. Yeah, I'm like Mr. Skin for dongs. You, Mr. Man. No, I just remember, <laughs> I remember that. I remember the Kevin Bacon one because I was working at the theater and we were watching an employee viewing of it. And I went to see the movie. I wanted to see the movie because I wanted to see Neve Campbell take her top off. You definitely wanted to see Kevin Bacon's show. No. I knew there was a supposed sex scene between... Um, hey, spoilers. We might do Neve that Campbell. movie at some point. Okay. Are we going to ever do Wild yeah. Things, though? I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. And, the, and Denise Richards. like She was in her prime when that movie came out. Okay. Denise Richards. So it was like, oh, they're going to so, do something. And you were surprised by No, Kevin I didn't Bacon's. get to see Neve Campbell, but I got to see Kevin Bacon. And that Why didn't angered you get to me. to see Neve Campbell? Because she didn't take, she, even did, in the sex scene, she didn't take anything off, just like in Scream. What? <laughs> <laughs> it was almost exactly like Scream. And it was like, okay, the price of, oh, I didn't pay to see the movie, but the price of admission was to see that. And in the end, I just got, that is, I got a bit of a bacon. That is a major major bait and switch. Hi, this is Dan in post. I believe you refer to that as a bacon switch. All right, carry on. Yes. So that's why I False remember it. Not because I was cataloging it, but I remember that. Speci- Plus, you hardly ever see that in a movie, so when you do see it, you you do remember it. Dude, it's Not like... Not in a good way. <laughs> I came here to see tits, and I saw a dick. Yes. That is like ultimate... It is a bait and switch. Yeah. I mean, you saw Denise Richards, but I already yeah. George seen hasn't well, seen the a scene. Consolation. <laughs> See, George hasn't seen the scene. He doesn't understand. He's he's dissing on right. a movie with an, the iconic sex scene of the '90s. I think. What's that? Wild uh, things. Wild things. Like oh, I'm not. Di- 90s, I'm not dissing it. After Basic Instinct. It's a great movie. It's a good movie. We should watch it. I'm not dissing it. Yeah, I'm just trying to, to put myself movie. in Travis's shoes at the time. Yeah, I'm just trying to explain why I remember Dick. <laughs> because. When it happens in a movie that you you're not expecting, you, don't it, you see do it, remember it. You don't see it in movies. This ever. is a safe yeah, space, right. Travis. You don't have to explain. I'm sorry. It. It's fine. And same thing with Arnold. Like when he's walk after he arrives in Terminator and he's walking towards the guys where he gets his clothes. I don't know why Cameron filmed it this way, but you, the street light catches his schwang as he's walking and you see dangling. And I'm like, what? 
What? Why? Why not? Why man? do I need to see that? Why does the robot have that a dick, so. though? That seems like wasted <laughs> effort. That's a great question. I mean, if it's it was like the thing recreation, I'd get it, right? Because. Right. But. Yeah, it's replicating. But why does a cyborg need it? Yes, definitely. I would ask that question. Has has Meg sent any messages while we've been talking? No, <laughs> she's already left. <laughs> she's gone. <laughs> There's a note. I was wait. I was waiting for a bling because I was like, oh my god, we've been talking for like 15 minutes about. <laughs> well, well, I mean, <laughs> we have to talk about this because it's part of the movie. This that's what this movie is. Yeah. So I mean, but it, this movie is so much more, and that's the thing, right? Like, it would be very no, easy yes, to reduce absolutely. this, and so many people do. They they reductionally reduction. They treat this movie reductionist. <laughs> they don't give this movie its due. They spend too much time talking about Sharon Stone's nudity, and they miss Many the point that it's actually a hell of a movie, guys. Many much moosen. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm glad this movie has legs, and no pun intended there. But when it came out, that's what everybody <laughs> talked about. Okay, pun intended. <laughs> everybody talked about that. Yes. But in the end... This movie has longevity because Absolutely. of everything else. Absolutely. And the people that originally went to see it to go see that part. Absolutely. Fell in love with but the movie. But you can't as a, do as a you as can't a do a podcast episode about this movie and not talk about no. boobs. Exactly. You have to. You guys want to hear part. my take on striptease? Oh god. Sure. This is my take on striptease that I've just Should invented. Never happened. No, uh, I'm glad it happened only because it got Burt Reynolds back into shape. For yes. Boogie Nights, which is Boogie a Nights, right. hell of a movie. And he may not do mm-hmm. Boogie Nights if he's not in striptease, so it's all worth it. It's true. That's true. It's a hell of a movie, guys. Have you ever seen Boogie Nights, George? Mm-hmm. Ooh. Nope. What are we watching next? <laughs> if you guys haven't figured this out, you ain't seen I shit? haven't seen it. Yeah. any movies. You ain't, yeah. you ain't so. seen, seen 52 shit. movies. <laughs> 53. You know what's funny? We didn't show him American Beauty. Right. I was talking to my boss because he knows that I podcast and I was like late the other night or the other day. And he was like, but it's a matter of podcasting last night. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, sometimes he's right. But um, he's like, what is your podcast about? And I was like, it's about movies. And he's like, and I've told him what the podcast mm-hmm. is about, right? And he'll ask me if I've seen a movie. And I'm like, no. And he's like, you haven't seen blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Welcome to the and club, you, And you have a podcast about club. movies? And I was like, dude, I told you <laughs> that the the point is that I haven't seen any movies. Right. So he's like, have you seen this? Oh, my God, I can't believe you have a podcast about movies and you haven't seen this. So he's like, impersonating us from not a couple about, years ago. It's not about movies. <laughs> it's about me. Right. And I haven't seen any movies. So. Anyways, I just thought that was funny. He's like, dude, you're not even listening to me. <laughs> it's about the fact that I haven't seen any movie. Did you get in his face like Farley? What were you thinking? <laughs> Pull your pants up. I wish. You're being a van down by the river. Serious question, though, guys. Mm. Does this movie know what an alibi is? Because I don't think it does. Um... Well, traditionally, an alibi is where you were at the time that eliminates you from being able right. to do it. And George, I couldn't have been at the scene of that murder because I wrote it in a book years ago. Because I wrote a book. That's not it's an not alibi. It's not an alibi per se. It is... It's like an a... alibi would be if she was writing the book during the murder and someone was watching her yes, write Yes, I was at a Starbucks <laughs> right, typing yes, on my alibi. laptop. Right. There's there's documentation that you were online three cities away. That's an alibi. It is. What is that though? If not what an she alibi. Was talking about? Yeah. What is uh, it, what is that called? They were trying to cute with a cute word, trying to basically say I'm not that stupid, or am I? Am I that stupid? The problem is that's not an alibi. The problem is that that is, is a it? word with a definition, <laughs> so you really can't be that flexible. But I mean, I guess it, at best you could argue what that would be it's, the word for that. Then I mean, it's an attempt to establish reasonable doubt. Right. So it's like this is my reasonable yes. doubt attack. I am saying I'm attacking your argument with reasonable doubt, which is why would I have written this book? But it's not an alibi. It's reasonable yeah, doubt. An alibi, not an alibi is not an attack on reasonable doubt. 
That's a attack good way with that. reasonable. It just removes you from the situation. Because you're, using, it, you're you. using reasonable doubt to attack an argument or a, a prosecution right. is what you're doing. So you are yielding, like an ice pick, reasonable doubt, and you are stabbing the prosecution in the face. Did you guys get to watch the extended and cut? Or and in the eye through the nose? Good. Okay, yes. Nostril? So you saw the more extended cut. Oh, my That was gosh. cut out of the U.S. release originally, and they put it back in. As you can see, that was pretty gross, but kind of awesome. I actually, I rewound it twice. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm. I did. Because the first time it happened, I wasn't ready for it. and It wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. <laughs> and the first thing I thought was, I don't know why, but sometimes like when someone's getting wrecked like that, I have like the the most like uh nonchalant reaction at first. That doesn't and surprise me at all. Yeah, so like from she George. starts stabbing him in the f- she starts stabbing him in the face and I was like I, th- I thought this was going really well. <laughs> like that's the first thing I thought. It was like And then I was like, "Hold on. Those effects, I need to see those effects again." And I need to see that one more time. Nice. It's really gross, and, man. Uh, it was it's good. So good. It was good. It it kind of reminds me of like in seven, when uh, I guess it's uh, lust, mm-hmm. and he straps that that mm-hmm. blade on. Yes, Ugh. everyone knows what. And yeah. when he's telling that story, mm-hmm. uh, like they don't show you anything. No, <laughs> but in your head, you're picturing exactly what happened. Yeah, it's an old Hitchcock trick. Ugh. And then he put me put and then he made me put it on me put that fucking thing on him. Like it's just like yeah. you don't have to see anything and you feel all of it. Yeah. That's acting. Yeah. And that's in this movie. Definitely in this movie. But in this movie they also show all the gross stuff. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hi, Karumba. Speaking of effects you had to rewind, this week I was watching a movie. It's a documentary called Mail Order Murder. It's a story mm. about Wave Productions, which is out of, I think, Philadelphia uh, or New Jersey. New Jersey. It's out of New Jersey. I, I don't know. I don't know where it's Sounds out. Sounds like the Unabomber. But mm. it's a, a guy who made like straight from a camcorder movies in the 80s and 90s and sold them in mass to people by mail order. And by the end, okay. they're like taking bespoke requests, you know, like, you know, I really want to see women drowned in quicksand can you make a movie all about that and they're like okay you know and they're making these insane shot on a video camera terrible anyway i don't think i could ever sit through a single one of those movies but watching the greatest Mm -hmm. hits of these shot on video while they're talking to these perfectly reasonable adults who made these movies and don't seem crazy which is weird because you'd think they'd be a little loonier Mm. when you see them acting in these horrible movies Anyway. Oh, money's money. There was, well, paycheck and that's the thing. Yeah, it's clear that these guys were here to make, you know, commodities, and they did, but also, like. Well, that's what, eight, uh, did you ever see 8 millimeter? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they kind of touch on that as well. But this but is, like, way less I mean, gross that's... than 8 millimeter. Although, right, right, right. there was one effect. The reason I bring it up, there was an effect on there I'd never seen before. Somebody tried to do a, a specific kill effect, and I, I kind of caught it, and it's so short, I was like, wait, did I just rewind it, watch again? Oh my God, one more, you know, and I was just like, that is so gross. Anyway, mm. if you want to see a gross uh, murder effect I'd never seen in a movie, it's in one of those shot on video clips in Mail Order Murder. And let me tell you, that's a fun watch. I recommend it. Is that on Netflix? Just came out from Vinegar Syndrome uh, through one right. of their like partner releases. There's only like 300 left. You guys better hurry up and get them. By the time we publish this, it'll be sold out. Too late. Fuck. It's pretty cool. I'll just borrow it from you. Oh, they're doing a standard edition. There's a thousand of those okay. left. So, yeah, gotcha. chances are there will be one available by the time you hear this. You should get it. Mail Order Murder. It's amazing. It makes me think that Travis and George could really be making movies in New Jersey right now. <laughs> do it. And I'm pretty thrifty, so I could probably do something. Yeah. And Make I think a drowning video. you're Just already a better a actor than water. any of the men in these movies, so oh, good. go for it. Hey. I don't know how well I would be able to act dying. Well, the guys never die in these movies. That's why it's okay. so gross. Right. <laughs> these are gross movies. Don't watch these movies, but watch the documentary because it's interesting. Gotcha. Hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe when I make the the butt butt work. Butt work. I'll I'll throw in some of those uh scenes. Just show a scene where a woman gets <laughs> shrunk down and then eaten. Well, it's like Silent Bob sinking some quicksand. 
Mm. <laughs> we'll have Dante uh, hit and somebody not, in the and head and not with say a anything. Machete, and have him roll backwards down the steps. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Reverse luge style. Reverse nice. luge. I wasn't even supposed to be working today. Here's the question I have for you regarding Scream, which we covered a few weeks ago. That mm-hmm. movie trashes Sharon Stone by name three different times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Having now watched Basic Instinct, why are they trashing Sharon Stone? I don't think they're trashing Sharon Stone. In Scream? They don't trash her. What they're what they're doing is Sharon Stone in the nineties was notorious for being slutty. The movies she made were all sexual thrillers, like Sliver and this and uh what was the other one? She, uh well Basic Instinct Two. Like the nineties were her time to shine in the bedroom. So what Stu says is yeah, she was flaunting her shit around town like she was Sharon Stone. And let's face it, Sid, she's no Sharon Stone. Like he was basically saying she was she was a sexual predator. Yeah, in what, the town. what he was saying was Your mom's she a was, slut. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So she was being you know, the way Sharon Stone is in this movie. Now we're talking like five movies in the '90s were basically her playing the same character, right? But when they when they say it in Scream, it's it's not like I don't think it's like, and they're not trying to say that Sharon Stone is a slut, right? Right? They are saying that the mother in Scream was was. But she was trying to be Sharon Stone. I think it, so. It also, Sharon Stone is a, is is on a different level. See, now I would allow it if screen. that was the only mention. But they bring up Sharon Stone two other times by name. What's the other mention? The, the, I don't remember the specific. I'd quote have to look it up. Yeah, we'd have to we'd have to look at every when he single says she's mention. She's flaunting her shit like Sharon Stone. He's basically making reference to her opening her legs and showing her cash and prizes. Right. That's what he's saying. So he's like, she's flaunting her shit around town like she's Sharon Stone. And she's no Sharon Stone. Like she's, right. He's saying she's not I don't even see that caliber. That, I don't see that as a slight to Sharon Stone. Right. Now, the other two, I don't know. I'd have to hear it. Yeah. I see that as like Sharon Stone is on a different level. Well, they bring you her up be, uh, just randomly. Dewey says, you're not supposed to be here. And Gail Weathers is like, I should be in New York covering the Sharon Stone stalker. But who knew? You know. Right. What? Like, Why is uh, she here? Uh, then maybe there's... Kevin Williamson just has a hard on for her. He is my age, so maybe he, she touched him in a special. Way. Maybe it's just it's weird because <laughs> and... she comes up multiple times. Uh, and there, other than that one kind of random one, I I got the impression that the movie was like, you know, uh, not appreciative of what Sharon Stone brought to the role in Basic Instinct and other roles to follow. Mm-hmm. And it just seemed to me that maybe, maybe now far enough away we can you know, revisit this movie and be like, hey, actually, she's a hell of an actress and, like, Michael Douglas had just a high body count in this movie as she did, so why aren't we making fun of Michael mm-hmm. Douglas? You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I look at more as, I mean, in the day now, everything's an Easter egg. Everything is, you know, the director's throwing it in as an homage or, you know, we're making mention here. I, I, I look at her mention in that movie as how big of a star she was at the time that she's big enough to where it, because there's a lot of things in scream that are very pop culture driven for the time, like watching it now, a lot of the things are kind of falling on deaf ears because if people don't know their pop culture from the nineties. They might not know everything and you don't get any more nineties pop culture than like Michael Jackson, comments or Sharon Stone comments or MC Hammer comments like there's just stuff about the 90s that uh might not age well. Do they talk about MC Hammer and Scream? I don't think so. That would but be I amazing. Think, but also it, That would be great. <laughs> well, it would be amazing unless they were sh- uh, slut shaming him in which case come on. I mean that man's pants are magic. Yeah, again, I don't think they which were which he sl- deserves. No, it's fine. Yeah, I don't know. Again, I I know what you're saying, but I don't think that's what they were. I think they were slut shaming her mother by saying she was opening her legs. 
and the only reference to that that everybody would get back then, 90, was it 96? When the Scream came out? Yeah, 96. 96. So we're talking, f- you know, four years from this movie, probably a couple movies in, Sliver being another movie just like this, but she's more vic- the victim than than the uh, the protagonist or the antagonist. So I just, I honestly think they were just, it's a mention, just like you would mention Joe Pesci, uh, De Niro, like De Niro gets mentions when, whenever you mention anything that has to do with mafia or Italians in your movie, you're going to be like, what do you think you are? You think you're De Niro? Or they'll say something like, you're talking to me? Like they'll, they'll make that's, reference in just by saying lines. That's how I saw it. Yeah. I didn't see it as they were slut shaming her. Per se, because in the end, she took the part. I know that part's not in the script, and that was a decision they made while filming. But the 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 legend is did did she consent to them putting that scene in the movie, or was that something? That was that them spitballing on the set <laughs> while she shot? That's it, so. yeah. That's the controversy. That the that's quote I heard scene, from but, her was that. Watching it for the first time in a movie theater, she turned to Paul Verhoeven and said, you can see my labia, and punched him. (laughs) Did she say that? That's the quote I saw. Okay. So I don't know. She doesn't seem very excited about the new re-release because it's the extended European cut. Right. Did you notice how in Basic Instinct they do the old Hollywood thing up front where smoking is sex for like the first 20 minutes in the movie? That was a weird old school thing. Mm. Reminded me of like the (laughs) 50s. There, there's a funny uh, video where they talk about that interrogation scene oh. where she never freak. She keeps lighting the cigarette, and then all of a sudden the cigarette in her hand is not lit, and then she's lighting the cigarette. Like she never really finishes one cigarette, but she's like chain smoked like seven. But see, Travis, every time she lights the, the cigarette, it's actually in her mind. But every time the cigarette's already lit, it's actually in their <laughs> minds. Right. It's a perfect. But scene. The chair's still the chair is there the whole time. So. <laughs> and the outlet is on the wall. <laughs> so where do we go from here? What's our next? Uh, do we go with what I s- sent you l- last week, or are we go oh, with what yeah, you said the tonight? The D, the D, the D. Okay. Well, to continue the tradition of amazing acting in these A-list movies, we're gonna do a favorite of mine. That I hope. I hope. You'll like. I'm not going to give it away wh- why you'll like it, but uh, one flew over a cuckoo's nest. Do you know who's in that? You know anything about it? You know any kind of history of it? Does it ring a bell? I'm sure you've well, seen. Well, the pictures. title is a. Am I thinking it? It's a book, right? It is a book. It's like a famous book, right? Yes. Like a like a classic literature. Yes. Book. Um, I think, um, is it a guy in a leather jacket? No, <laughs> no. <sighs> Who is in it? Plays a really good crazy guy though. Mm. I can see his face. Is Nichols in it? I don't know. Is it? I mean, you can tell if I, if I, <laughs> if I'm thinking of the right movie, Dan, you can tell me or not. I mean, I haven't watched it in a while. I don't remember. <laughs> All right, Man, so that means me he either. is. <laughs> okay, so I think I think I know the movie. I don't know anything about the plot though. Okay. But I think Nicholson is crazy in this. Okay. But maybe I'm completely wrong. I don't know. I haven't seen it. Cool. All right. Thank you for joining us on the Remedial Film Class Podcast. As always, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash remedial film pod. You can email us at remedialfilmpod at gmail dot com. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram at Remedial Film Pod. You can find us on YouTube and all your favorite podcatchers like Spotify and Stitcher and Podcast Addict and Apple Podcasts and anything else you can shake an RSS feed at. We'll see you back here next week for One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. (laughs) 